All right. Thank you everyone for tuning in to the second video in the series I put together on painting this Conan model. Trying to replicate the Simon Bisley style artwork that I showed in the first video. So this second video focuses primarily on refining and finishing off the skin tone as well as touching up the hair and the leather in preparation for the final video where we finish off the leather and paint the non-metallic metals. But the primary focus of this second video and in fact this painting series is the skin tone. And it's a fantastic sculpt. I talked about it a lot in the first video. Very, very detailed anatomically correct sculpt that has a lot of interesting volumes to play around with. So as I talked about a little bit in the first video, I'm going to elaborate a bit on now. The, the artwork is one of my favorites, but it's also in a very painterly style, not at all realistic exaggerated hands, exaggerated facial features, exaggerated musculature. And in many ways, even though Arnie does have pretty exaggerated musculature, it's still a realistic proportions of musculature and the artwork does not retain that similarity of shape. So it was around this point that I realized that being able to replicate the same interpretations of light from the first, from the artwork, wasn't going to be possible. And I would have to reevaluate how I was going to approach it and try and integrate those same values, which was the, which was the really interesting aspect of the painting was how high a value the skin tone went up to, as well as the richness of color in the skin tone. But how I could do that in a way that was accurate to the model. And so that was the, the fun, fun part of this painting experience. And I think one of the, I guess, mantras that I have in painting is very much focused on trying to learn something new every time I sit down and paint a model. It doesn't necessarily have to be uh, elaborate or you know, earth-shattering revelation every time. It's more about experimenting and evolving every time I paint. So the you know, the evolution on this one was all about trying to translate artwork into miniature, trying to translate a two-dimensional piece into something that has three dimensions. So the things I took away from the really studying the artwork was, as I said just before, the, the value uh, shift from light to dark, but also the saturation and richness of the skin tone that there's a lot of a lot of color in the skin even though it goes up to a very light highlight the, the skin tone itself is almost orange and it's not it's not a skin tone that I've experimented with before and in many ways it's not even a skin tone color and so when I tried to find a color from my range that replicated that skin tone, or at least the mid-tones of that skin tone, I found myself leaning towards an orangey brown, which was the peanut butter. Such a cool name for a paint. So finding that and starting to experiment with that as the, as the main color really changed up this skin tone into something much more interesting. And I think the, the, the takeaway that I've had from this is there's so much more richness of color that you can experiment with and a skin tone 
doesn't necessarily have to be constrained by a paint color that says something flesh. Uh, so as you can see, I've, I've again pulled out the airbrush and as I mentioned in the last video, there's a lot of back and forth. You also would have seen from the, the paint in the cup there, there's, there's very minimal amounts of paint that I've actually mixed. It's very, very small amounts. As I continue to just back and forth use the airbrush to really smooth the sketchy highlights or as was in the last case add some more orange red into the the areas that needed them as per the artwork but as I said there's there's so much richness of color in this uh, artwork that what I, what I found every time I added a a light, I just wanted to go back in and add more richness, more saturation to the color so that it felt more orange, which was a, a novel uh, experience. So I did actually use a little bit of an ink intensity color alongside the peanut butter at a later stage, and that was uh, one of the new inks from the ink intensity set two. It was ink intensity ochre. Uh, this is more green with the airbrush. That uh, might not actually be in this particular run of airbrushing. It may actually be in the later stages with that intensity. But it was really important to continue bringing the model back to that richness of skin tone and away from the desaturated more contrasted colors that I would normally go for. So there, I mean, one of the great things about the airbrush, the tool, I talked about it a lot in the previous two videos, was just the versatility and variety of applications you can use it for. You can use it for pretty minor details. That head is the size of my thumbnail, if not smaller, and I was able to pinpoint add green tones to the lower half of the face and neck without really much difficulty aside from the last five years of practice I suppose. So this is again once again really taking all of that work I did before and ultimately painting over it but leaving some of the nuance and some of the colors that were there before just left showing with some subtlety so I think I said in the last video a better painter than I probably would have been able to do this without as much back and forth but for me there's there's no clear cut number of layers there's no specific amount of you know I do a highlight then I do a then I do a shadow and then I go back in and smooth the highlight. You know, there's, there's no specific number of things that make for the right combination. It's always repetition until I find a balance. And I think the easy mistake to make with the airbrush is uh, one thing I mentioned a lot is with you, with your, oh, a little bit of water spray there, that's magnificent, that's me cleaning out the airbrush by the way, I use uh, cleaner and water and I blast it into the airbrush and then use the backflow technique which sometimes spits water out everywhere, fantastic. Uh, it's important to use that uh, light trick with, it, with, with how a model appears and how colors appear based on the colors around them. The hair is such a great example on this model. Yeah, this model looks like the, the skin tone doesn't have probably enough contrast, or at least the, the face doesn't, until I paint the face or the hair black, and all of a sudden the face looks, looks completely different. So it's an illusion, it's a trick of the eyes, but it's one important part of the process in painting. So this next... Uh, that was obviously a layer of matte varnish, which I've mentioned, help 
smooth out the various reflective surfaces. I love the complete and utter change in appearance after doing the matte varnish. Never feels like it's different. But you look at that versus prior and you just see a, a world of change. So vital part of really understanding what the model actually looks like, I think. So again, this is that the black in the hair. I'm intentionally putting some strokes of black into the actual skin. Even though the hair is sculpted, it's nice to just have a little bit of very thin lines. That's not very thin. <laughs> Good cleanup work there. That's magnificent stuff. There you go. Easy to easy to mix up, easy to get it wrong. And the camera's struggling to focus, it's too excited about that paintbrush. There we go. Yes, leaving a few little lines on the skin. Uh, very thin, very dilute paint using the Chimera Black, which is extremely thin paint, which I think helps this process a lot. And that's me using a moist brush to soften it out. The small lines just help tie the model together. You don't necessarily have to have the sculpted hair to really bring the only areas of hair into the model using a little bit of your own intuition about where the hair should go and also just adds a little bit more life, realism. So I've reached a point with the skin tone where I'm, I'm more happy with how the lights and shadows and colors look. And this, but it's a very airbrushy feel. And when you look at the artwork, it's not, it's not airbrushed, it's, it's sketchy. It's got very clear light and shadow and specific elements. So I do want to go back in and continue as always to just add a little bit more shade, a little bit more texture to the skin tone. But this is much closer to where I wanted it to look like. So you can see if you compare that shot to the one that I took after the first round of airbrushing or the one that I took after the second round of airbrushing, you can see there is there is a significant shift in how the transitions are built up, where the light is placed, and all of the nuance of color in there. So I think that's the value of working back and forth in multiple attempts. So again, I've pulled out some contrast paints here. Not, this is a, a a much a new addition to my process. I haven't really had a lot of experimentation with them. I am just really enjoying working out what I can use them for and what I can't. I think they're really fantastic for leathers and colors that have a lot of natural variation. I think there's strengths and weaknesses to this. I think they have a very shiny finish, which would be a downside if it wasn't for the wonders of the AK Interactive that I use. So using them to, and you can see there I'm mixing Gorgrunter fur with an orange and also I think that's a little bit of black on the model while it's still wet working them all together. It's helpful to have that wet in wet style because you really do create natural variation which is important for hair and fur and leathers. The The downside, and I think this is probably their weakness and probably something I need to be a little bit more cognizant of is they're very saturated colors and if you've worked with a lot of desaturation or you, you, you're manipulating desaturated colors around and then you go and throw a contrast paint in it, it very much will 
uh, take over, overpower the piece. So it's something you have to be very, very aware of. This is probably an aspect of my painting I feel is weakest, is my control over saturation. There's a magnificent painter called Mark Masklins who, when you look at the skin tones that he works with, he's got so much nuance, but he uses so many greys, grey tones mixed in with his colours that it just... I think it's a, it's a really powerful control over saturated and desaturated colors and it's something I've been trying to work with a lot more recently so the journey goes on that cool color there was a Vallejo model air color called signal blue very dark very rich very cold it's one of my favorite colors for shadows it is a model air color so the consistency is very dilute and it is quite uh, reflective can dry a little shiny particularly when used through a brush but it's got such a lovely cold color and because of the way the, air, the airbrush paints are put together they tend to work slightly differently to a model paint model color paint and you get some some different effects which I quite like so that's the base coats of the metal here and that is a German gray which is a color that has definitely fought its way into my rotation a lot recently it's my favorite base coat color for metallic silver. You can see the color itself, especially when you compare it next to the orange and the, the black of the hair. It's quite a bluish tone. Still dark, but you can definitely see that that's sense of blue in there. And I'm just using this as a starting point for the metallic colors. I will go into those in a lot more detail in the third and final video in this particular series, but the basic volumes you can start to create even with just your first sketches and first lights. So the, the skin, the little light there on the chin, again, just very much looking at the artwork here, you can actually see it a little bit of paper from the artwork that's sitting literally beside the beside the grey cardboard I've got for the background where I am just keep referring back to the model and looking at the different shapes. He's got a very distinct spot of light on his chin. So I kept trying to go back in there, but it was a very interesting tone. It had it was a, a cold light, even though the rest of the face had warm colours. And there was also cold lights on the nose even though the nose was mostly red so I kept I really probably spent much more time on the face than I normally would because I kept going back to that artwork and trying to trying to visualize how I could make it look more like that even though this the sculpt itself was such a realistic face Conan what is best in life So this is, once again, just bringing more of that green, that's the olive green from Vallejo, model colour. Because I've glazed over it with the airbrush and, and taken a lot of that power of the colour away, just using the brush and putting it back in there is really helping to add the nuance and depth of colour. It's more green. So that's Chimera Red. It's really nice red. It's not. It's actually not my favourite red. And again, it's it's the only reason it's not my favourite is consistency. It's very dilute. So I use it for glazing, which is what I'm doing here, and it's absolutely fantastic for that. I prefer it to most washes 
uh, sorry, most inks because it's got that very, very rich pigment. But it because it's so thin, I don't I don't use it for everything. If I need a red, I'll either use Scale 75 Antares red or the Chimera red. The Chimera red I tend to use more for glazing. And I'm bringing that Chimera red and some of the Vallejo model color Scarlet again back into the skin tone. The Scarlet's actually more orange than red. So by mixing the two together, I get somewhere in between. And I'm just here back and forth some very thin subtle add addition of color some uh, washes s using the moist brush to feather out the transitions back and forth regularly checking versus the artwork seeing where I need to add more colors this is a really important stage I think you can start to see that um, now, even though with the airbrushing, it looked very neat and smooth, by just adding this little bit of nuance, a little bit of redness, a little bit more color, and as you'll see very soon, some final highlights. It's very much a more refined looking piece. So... One thing I talked about in the Nun video is my tendency to avoid painting the rear of models. It has to do with two things, viewing angles. Most of the pieces I paint will sit in a cupboard, a cabinet, don't often get picked up and turned around. So there's a lot of effort invested in something that isn't going to be looked at. So I like to fixate on a very specific viewing angle and make sure that that is the area where the model looks most accurate the lights are placed you know everything looks correct there is exceptions to that rule and this model is one where I use a circular base I don't always follow this rule but I feel like if you put a model on a circular base the natural tendency is to, to want to turn it around and manipulate it around. And so if I have a model on a circular base, my first question will usually be, do I want to paint the back so that this model can be a full 360 viewing experience? Uh, the, sec the second reason I, I think about painting the back or not is if there's anything on there that's interesting. The, mo the most interesting thing is for me to paint is the, the face, weapons... You know, the really the meaty parts of a of a model, the cool bits, the paint. But it's very rare for a back of a model to be as enjoyable. This model is an exception, though. The, there's probably not been a lot of focus on it because of the, the lighting, but the back, the sculpture on the back is just sublime. And for whatever reason, because of the way I approached it, it just it came out. So 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 cool <laughs> so I think I got the back almost exactly how I wanted it on the first try and the front because I kept trying to replicate the artwork and replicate those big lights really struggled with uh, this is once again a little bit of glazing I've used the ink tense ochre here I believe tweaked added back that saturation and richness really reached a point here where this is this is the skin tone that I was looking for very intense but still has clear light and dark even though the dark is more red but there's a clear separation between light and dark that's the that's the goal ultimately of painting is to create contrast whether it's value light and dark or warm and cold Textured and smooth, big and small. So using the varnish again, this is probably a little bit sooner than I normally would, but two reasons. I wanted to get rid of that shine, kill the shine on the contrast, and also seal in that layer of ink 
that I'd just done over the skin. So this is the last airbrushing I've done on the skin now. The next few stages are all brush for those final lights. And really nice skin tone. They're really interesting colors, but the artwork has clear light spots on the skin. So this is me trying to really replicate that. This is a great shot. I love looking at a, at the top of a model's head for 20 seconds. Come on, Deno. Cut that out, mate. Stop being lazy. Uh, so I've gone back to sunny skin tone and peanut butter. And I've mixed a tiny bit of Inktense ochre in here. And this is very precise, really considered placement of lights. Trying to look at the artwork and treat that as the gospel for where lighting should be. But trying to expand that into a three-dimensional surface. Really fun exercise, actually. I'd, if you can find a piece of artwork that you like, even if it's just colors that you like or a style that you like, and trying to replicate that on a three-dimensional surface is a fun experiment. There's a guy called Athami Alonso uh, from a website, Not Original Minis. He's, he's very original, <laughs> very recognizable models. And he does this really interesting thing where he, he has a lot of two-dimensional art techniques and he replicates that in a three-dimensional surface. Things like, like backlighting. You don't tend to see a lot of backlighting in miniature painting. It's more of a two-dimensional illustration technique. It's basically when you've got light coming from behind the model and so you get a subtle glow on the very edges of a model even if there's light coming from the top and you know, let's say you had a, a, a sphere or you know like Conan's shoulder here and the light's coming from in front and at the top you'll have at the top of that sphere uh, the light rebounding and then on the on the edge of the, the shoulder you would have a second light, usually a slightly different tone, usually a colder tone, which is highlighted as well. And so this, it doesn't tend to work, again, when, when you have many viewing angles. It doesn't feel quite as right when you rotate the model around and you see what is ultimately a painted light. But it it's, adds a, a lot of nuance to lighting and I have experimented with it a little bit I did a, a model from Industria Mechanica which is a American production company of mecha kits large-scale kits and they had a, a model by an artist named Ignacio Ruiz I think it was off the top of my head is his Instagram handle is Pencracker. he does really cool artwork you should go and check it out and the model in question that I bought was one called Zangra Hell, a one to eight scale model, so not a bust. It was taller than a water bottle, very, very challenging to paint. And because I loved the artwork of Ignacio so much, I went in and did similar to what I've done here, tried to replicate the artwork, although in the instance of that model, it was an exact replica of the artwork, the model, so it was... A little bit easier than trying to transcribe like I did on this one but there, there was actually backlighting on there and I experimented with that if you ever want to understand what I'm talking about you can go and have a look at the pictures of that model it's on putty and paint and the calf is a great example of that backlighting that I was referring to or you can go and look at not original minis and a lot of his work would also give you a, probably a better idea so that skin tone is much, much more alive now, much more vibrant. There's very clearly defined lights and shadows, but you've still got all that richness, all that color. So what I'm doing here is just working on joining the volumes together. I talked in the first video about how 
even though all of these parts of skin look like separate volumes and they need to be treated as such, they're also one piece. And so you have to pull them together by just joining them and connecting them with some some lights. So this is the brush glazing here where I'm taking a very dilute paint and using it to smooth the transitions in the same way as I do with the airbrush but just being a little bit more precise than some of the previous work and because the paint's so dilute because I've mixed in the magic mix it's just helping the pigments set a little more evenly so at this point the the painting I've done has been around two hours and 20 minutes so I'm just trying to do maths in my head and double the length of the two videos that I've just commentated on so yeah, about two hours two hours 15 two hours 20 to get that result there in two hours 20 years something I think is really a testament to why I use this technique. There's, that's really, really fast time frame for that result in my perspective. I'm sure that other people could achieve it in similar time, probably better, but I think that speed for that result is why I use the, t the techniques that I do. So this is all thin glazes, just smoothing, working in the colors, sunny skin tone and peanut butter, back and forth, lights, shadows, smoothing, etc., etc. And that was me taking the model out from underneath the light on my table and looking at under natural light. That is one of the best tips I can ever give anyone. If you genuinely want to know what your model looks like, don't look at it under the lights, look at it under normal lighting. It'll give you a much better sense of if you have enough contrast. Especially if you're talking about gaming miniatures, because they're always used on a table that doesn't have studio lighting. If you're painting display stuff, yeah, you can get away with not being as smooth, and having enough contrast, sorry, you, you can get away with not enough contrast because you'll see it under quality lighting. But for gaming miniatures and for my style, I like to have a lot of big pops of contrast. Uh, this is some quick sketches of light for the black hair. Very tricky to paint black. My approach is to do lights very bright and then use a couple of glazes of black so now the model's starting to take shape the face has a lot more life the skin looks very vibrant with lots of different colors so from this point onwards we work on getting the rest of the elements up to scratch and then looking at the hole and working on how we can improve aspects of the hole so that's it. That's the end of this second video. Third and final one next. Metals, leathers, and the finished product. Appreciate all the comments. And as always, if you have any questions, I'm on Twitter. You can comment on this video. Or you can do none of those things and just enjoy the video in silence. I also appreciate that. Paint the eyes down. Go on, do it. Black dot on the eyes. Go on, son. No, I don't think I'm going to do that here. You can do it. No, not happening. All right, that is it. Big Deno out.